Good morning, everybody. We have uh, people joining. Feel free to jump in and I can see Skip already. Mr. Ashmore, good to see you. Good morning, sir. How are you? Man, I'm always good. How are you? Good. Excellent. Good to see you. Mr. Mendoza, good morning, sir. Hey, how are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. Just give it a couple more minutes for people to join. And I'm going to get everything ready in the meantime. I got this new computer, so, and I got three screens. So, of course, you know, everything is now, let's see. Share this, so now you can see the opening screen, and I want to see if there are participants that are waiting to be admitted. Mr. Miller has joined us. Good morning, Mr. Miller. So mute. No? Yes? Like music, like waiting music when we have this. Rich, can you say hi? No, maybe. Um, I'm here. Can you hear me? There he is. There he is. How you doing, Miller? How's all? How are things in Atlanta? Things are great. Thank Good. you. Good. Where are you in uh, Connecticut? And actually, today I'm in Phoenix. Yeah. How uh, how warm is it over there? Uh, not too bad today. It's like ninety, which is okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah. All right. Phoenix is in the house. And good morning, Mr. Nair. Good to see your lovely face. Uh, how are morning. you? <laughs> oh, I, Adam. Adam, wait your turn. I'm talking to Patty first. Wait. <laughs> how you doing, Patty? I'm good. I'm good, Elan. How are you? Are you home in New Jersey? Yes, I'm home. All right. So we have New Jersey in the house. Thank you for joining. And uh, Adam, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. That's uh, awesome. Are you from Chicago? Yes, downtown Chicago. That's awesome. So we have Chicago in the house, Phoenix, Atlanta. I see a couple of names from Israel. Arizona, how are you, ma'am? Okay. Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Right. <laughs> okay. Hi, how are you? I'm so happy to join. Thank you very much for joining us from the Holy Land. That's uh, <laughs> you. Um, Definitely. Hi there. Lenore, yes. Lenore and Zieri, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Where are you uh, calling from? Um, I'm right currently in Woodstock, Georgia. Oh, Woodstock, right up the street. That's awesome. Yeah, up the street from where? From me. I'm in uh, Marietta. Oh, oh, all right. Down the street from Jordan, I think, right, Jordan? Now you're on mute. I'm up in Lawrenceville, so um, I'm on the other side of town. Wow, so there's a lot of Georgians on. Well, I'm not really a Georgian, in case you can't tell by my accent, but a lot of Georgians on the line. <laughs> where, where are you from? I'm, I'm from New York City. Ah, which part? I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, but I lived in Manhattan for most of my adult life. Very cool. We can yeah. talk about it uh, later. I, have, I see more people are uh, trying to get in, which is a good thing. So let them, I'm going to let them in, and then we're going to start. Um, so I think we have enough people to start. So welcome and thank you everybody for joining. Those of you who have been to some of my sessions before, uh, welcome back. Those of you are uh, first timers, welcome as well. I gotta warn you, uh, it's gonna be 
So this is going to be an interactive session, and uh, as you can see my screen, uh, this is chapter five of uh, The Power of Presence Without Being Present. For those of you who don't know, the whole thing started and was born when a lot of people started talking to me, okay, I figured out how to create a Zoom session. Now what? Right? So a lot of interactive things, a lot of emotional relationship things online are different and we're not aware of them. So how do we maximize them? So I've been doing this series uh, under my umbrella of emotional relevance. And if you haven't signed up for my uh, blog yet, I'm going to urge you to do so, please. Um, on my uh, website, alonzyber.com. And uh, go to blog, sign up. Every two weeks, you get a nice little story. And it's all under emotional relevance, as I said. And for those of you who are uh, new, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this, these sessions are interactive. And what we're going to do on uh, the first uh, couple of minutes here today is we're going to do a little recap. A little recap because all of my elements of emotional relevance I use and utilize and implement at every one of the sessions, every one of the elements that I use. And so uh, I want to do a quick recap. And since this is an interactive one, um, let's do it in an interactive manner. And everybody take your phones out, go ahead and go to kahoot.it and put the code in. Let's go, everybody. Lenore, I'm watching you. Skip, let's go. All right, Mr. Bernstein. Thank you for joining. Get your phone out. Hey, Marissa, thank you for joining. Good morning. I, I assume you're in California. Get your phone out, everybody, and start putting your nicknames in there. Make it fun. Um, Melissa, go ahead. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for people to join. Who's going to be the first one to put their name in there? Adam Doza. Lenore, excellent. Go ahead, guys. We're waiting for a few more. Shouldn't be that complicated. Let's go, Patty. Come on. Kahoot.it and just put the pin number in. All right, handsome Nick. Of course you're handsome, Nick. There you go. Rich just joined. Rocky. Woo! Who's Rocky? We'll find out. There's a, a contest in there. Michel, bonjour. You're muted, but I, I saw you said bonjour, ça va? I hope all is get good. Okay, let's go, people. Let's go. Only none of you. Aaron, I don't see you up there. Thank you, Jess. Good to see you. Galit, where are you? Please, Guy, join everybody. All right. I'll give you five more seconds. We're going to start. This is a recap of some of the elements in case you haven't been here before. Just some of the, the uh, as I mentioned, recap of uh, emotional relevance and what is it all about. So, three, two, hold on, Jesse. Jesse Tedisco, my brother from another mother. I'm waiting for you to join as well. YS, I don't know who that is, Never mind. Oh, Yariv probably. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here goes. Uh, five questions. The winner gets, are you ready for this? The winner gets an hour free session with me, one-on-one. -on -one. And here is the first question. The main reason we use emotional relevance is to be remembered. True or false? 10 seconds, true or false? Go ahead, select on your phone. On your phone. Four, three, two, one. All right, true. Mm -hmm. I don't know who said false, but we can see that Mr. Dosa was the quickest one. So you are indeed. Next question, ladies and gentlemen, of course, emotional relevance primarily is to be remembered. Content with what kind of image gets 94% more views than content without? 
Ladies and gentlemen, is it visual, emotional, R-rated, or relevant content? You got four things to answer, ladies and gentlemen. Who's not answering? The right answer, of course, is relevant. Content with relevant images gets 94% more views. When you post something on LinkedIn, when you use your presentations, this is science. Use it, it works, it's pretty awesome. So nice spread here. Uh, let's see who is in, oh, Rocky is in the lead right now. All right, by your smile, Aaron, I assume you're Rocky. Next, ladies and gentlemen, which of these is not one of the three elements of emotional, not one of the elements of emotional relevance? Which of these is not? Nine, eight, let's go, guys. five seconds. All right. The, your, most of you are right. Deliver results. Three main elements for relevance. Send out, make it back, and get personal. Who's now in the lead? Rocky, you're still in the lead? Wow. Wow, there is some... Uh, to follow, ladies and gentlemen, let's see who can break Rocky. 90% of information transmitted to our brain is blank. Presentations with blank are 43% more persuasive, persuasive, 60%, 65% of us are blank. All right. Don't get too serious over there, Marissa. What do you think it is? The answer is, that's right, visual. Yeah, I don't know who's vocal. Yarif, he really got it right. And wow, not even close. Rocky is killing it. Last question, ladies and gentlemen, for this recap. The most important piece in the effective communication cycle is the sender, the channel of communication, the receiver, or the feedback. Which one is it, ladies and gentlemen? Five seconds. Which one is it, ladies and gentlemen? Wow. Now, the most important one is the feedback. This is why in emotional relevance, one of the first important elements is two-way channel communication. And we're going to talk about it in a second. The winner, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for in the podium, uh, on uh, number third, number three, Lenore, second place, Mr. Handsome first place, ladies and gentlemen, Rocky, you just earned yourself uh, an hour uh, with me session to talk about whatever you want. So whatever. ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, participating. We're going to go back to uh, our presentation. We have a lot to talk about. And in about 35 minutes or so, uh, you will all know what is emotional anchoring, which is one of the elements of emotional relevance, ways of using emotional anchoring, and who is Jordan Mendoza? I can't wait to get to that part where we uh, interview Jordan a little bit. And Jordan, I'm so happy that you're here today. Really, it's a, it's a true pleasure, so I appreciate it very much. All right, let's talk about what what is, uh, what is emotional anchoring? The, you know, the definition is, is right in there, but if you want to look at it for a second in simplistic ways, and those of you who like to take notes, this is the part where you want to write it down. It's where you take your customer through an emotional experience and you cement that as an anchor that you can then trigger again and again and again but the most important thing is that you relate that experience to you or to your service or to your company or to your brand, whatever it is, okay? So whatever you use in that emotional experience, and we'll look at some examples, you wanna make sure that whenever they experience that emotional experience again, they're thinking of you, they're thinking of your brand, they're thinking of your service. 
feel free to ask questions and interrupt, ladies and gentlemen. But let's look at some um, at a great example and a great story. This is this is emotional anchoring at a very very high level. There's a coffee maker, American coffee maker, who tried to sell coffee in Japan, and they failed. And so they did a research, and why did they fail? So they interviewed all the people in uh, Japan, and they went to some emotional research, and they found out, ladies and gentlemen, that the piece in our brain that is related to the emotional sense of craving coffee is the same um, piece of our brain that is related to our emotional connection to mom. Now, why is that? Typical American, Saturday morning, Sunday morning, you go down the stairs, you smell the scent of aroma of the coffee that your mom is percolating already in the kitchen. Back of your mind, it gives you the sense of security. It gives you the sense of home. It gives you the same sense of trust and togetherness and feel hugged, all right? Every, anybody familiar with that notion of waking up in the morning as a kid and going down and, and, and you know, mom is making coffee? I see that a few of you are, are nodding. So they found out that in Japan, People don't do that. Moms don't percolate coffee in the morning, okay? So there was no real connection. Here in the US, when the coffee companies, and, and retail is very big on that. Retail know emotional relevance very well. Coffee companies know exactly how to make you scent and smell it and trigger that emotional experience you had when you were a kid, okay? That's great emotional anchoring. Can anybody please think of what this company did in order to get coffee into the J Japan? Andrew, any idea? Mr. Andrew Cross, any idea of what this company did in order to, to get the kids in Japan to crave coffee or the adults in Japan to crave coffee? Hmm. No idea. Anybody has any idea? So I'll tell you, what they did is they thought long-term. And what they did is they started selling in Japan coffee-flavored candy and ice cream. So those kids, when they grow up, when they smell the scent of coffee, right, it will trigger that emotional experience of eating candy and good ice cream when they were kids. So they would want the coffee to remind them of that experience. Does that make sense, everybody? All right, now that's long term. That's, you know, but it doesn't have to be so dramatic. It could be little things. Let me show you a couple more examples. Car and this flower. What brand of car comes to mind? Yes. Volkswagen. Volkswagen bug. Exactly, Volkswagen bug, right? They did an amazing campaign, put that sunflower in the car. Visual, it's a visual. When you go to your car, you feel a little more welcome. That's emotional, right? It's an emotional experience. Let's do a little other exercise. What company you think of when you hear this? Can't hear it. Can't hear it. You couldn't hear anything? <clears throat> Hold on. Let me play it from my phone. Here we go. No. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. This. Here we go. Still can't hear it well. Intel. 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 That's right. Here we go again. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Sound, visuals, sense, all emotional triggers. So it's enough when you go with your customer, whoever it is you're working with, 
and trigger them, create an emotional experience that could be visual, could be something that you smell, could be laughter, it doesn't matter. As long as you know that you planted that and then every time they hear it, they see it, they think of you, right? And then of course, my customers, I work on how you trigger that again and again uh, and again. Now, here's the interesting part. If you look at this timeline for a second, as this is your relationship with your customer, right? Where it starts with prospecting and you had initial sale, but then you have customer success relationship throughout the relationship and you have some upselling opportunities. You should use this technique of emotional anchoring anytime you can. It's not just like the coffee companies, right? One time in years, but throughout the relationship, you should use it with little different things because eventually, if you remember from earlier, eventually we want them to remember us. And when we do that emotional anchoring technique, we're literally planting more and more and more emotional anchors, which will get us closer and more connected and eventually build trust, okay? Look, when we meet face to face, sometimes you just feel it. Sometimes you just feel it. There's that connection. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm looking at Patty now. And I remember first time we met in New York, Patty, we ended up hugging each other because, no. right? Yep. And sometimes you just feel it and it's great. We made a, a personal connection and you know, we, the, the trust was there right from the beginning, right? Doesn't matter what kind of business we do together. We feel like we were friends on a personal level. Now, if I want to offer something to Patty, I will feel that much more open to do it. Vice versa, and he knows that. Okay. Um, Patty, by the way, for those of you who don't know, works for the National Basketball Association that is finally coming back in about a month. So thank you very much, Patty, for uh, for doing for doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Good to see you. So when you look at this timeline of the customer relationship, right, there are many places where you should use that technique. But today what I want to do is I want to focus on that anchoring right after the initial sale. Could be after any other sale, but specifically after the initial sale. Right? This is what I want to, what I want to focus on. Let's do a little case study. I bought shoes for my son, Adidas, okay? My 15-year-old son, shoe size 12, oh my God. Uh, bought him shoes, ordered them online. Before I show you what I got from um, Adidas, right? I wanna do a little, uh, exercise with you. Let's see if I can do it um, with, no, that's not it. Sorry. All right, I'll just gonna do this and try to hide this. So that's fine. Forgive me because I'm using online for now. So I'll take notes as we are doing this. Adidas is sending me an email confirmation after I purchased it, right? This is their great opportunity to establish that emotional inquiry. What do you think are some of the elements that need to be on that email? Some of the elements, as we talked about earlier from emotional relevance, what are some of the emails, some of the elements, sorry, that they need to have on this email. And I'm gonna take notes and then I'm gonna show you exactly what they sent me and we'll break it down. So please, anybody, what is one of the first thing that should be on this email? Confirmation of purchase. What you bought, how much, and when it's coming. Is that skip? Yeah. When it's coming. The most important information once you bought something is you wanna know when it's coming, especially when it's right? When is it coming, all right? So they wanna give me that information in a visual way that I know this is it, right? The most important piece. 
Okay, what else? Anybody? From emotional relevance elements, I'm gonna throw something out there. One of the things that I'm gonna highlight again and again and again is just like, what was the most important piece of the communication cycle? Anybody remembers? Feedback. Um... Feedback. That's right, feedback. Um, you get a private lesson today, Skip. Thank you very much. <laughs> I failed in the test, though. <laughs> well, but that's how you learn, right? You learn. So now you know. Feedback. You need to create two-way channel of communication. Mm -hmm. Two-way. How do you do that with an email confirmation? Any idea? How can you, if you're selling somebody something and you send them an email confirmation, how do you do that? How do you establish two-way channel communication? Ask for feedback. Ask for feedback, all right. How? Uh, surveys, um, is there anything else I can help you with? Um, let us know when you get it. Or upselling, upselling is a good form of feedback. Upselling, okay. What else, ladies and gentlemen? All right, let me show you. Let me show you what I got from them. Oh, before, before I show you, anybody here not familiar with cognitive dissonance? Anybody is familiar with cognitive dissonance? No? Yes, Lenore, do you know what cognitive dissonance is? Yeah, it's right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do know what it is. <laughs> what is it? It's you know, just being able to um, be aware of um, decision making and ways to think about things. So, yeah, but the, unfortunately, when we buy something, right, there's another term that is called buyer's remorse. Yeah. Right. When we buy something, we tend to doubt it. Uh, did we do the right thing? Uh, did I buy the right car? Did I spend that much money? And did I make the right decision? Right? And also, that's, it's also FOMO. FOMO. No. It's all related to the fact that we have some sort of a dissonance, some sort of doubts. And we as a sellers, we need to bridge that gap. We need to really help them believe in themselves and feel comfortable with what, what they did. And so that confirmation email, that's why when I talked about emotional anchoring at that specific point, it's very deep because this is your point where you can actually hit those emotional um, points that they're experiencing. Uh, there's an article that I read a few days ago. and Apparently, opening rates for confirmation emails is the highest by far. It's at 70%. Mm. 70%, right? Might as well plant something there that you can then relate it to later if they're going to open it, right? 70%. All right. So, again, if you want to take notes and tips, establish two way channel communication. Remember, the feedback is the most important piece. And, Ed, once you establish that channel of communication, what you want to do is add relevant and emotional information through this channel, which helps you establish trust. So let's look at the email I got from um, Adidas. This is an email with a missing piece that you'll see in a second. But the first and most important piece is, as Skip was saying, when is it coming? Big letters, right? Notice it's on the top left. Apparently our minds, I wanna, I wanna distinguish this, Americans, minds go, their eyes, visual, go first, top left. Because when we uh, read an article, whatever, you notice the title is on the top, the picture usually is on the left. So we are trained to go left. And the reason I say Americans, because for me as an Israeli, we actually write from right to left. So mm -hmm. instinct is actually top right, just in case anybody was wondering. So it's on the top left, right underneath the logo, it arrives on the 14th, it's big, one day left. 
But here's another thing. Here's how they're now establishing two-way channel communication, right? Hey, you want updates on the, uh, when it's uh, the delivery details? Through your uh, Facebook Messenger. Now, because I, I opened it through my uh, browser, I'm already logged in, right? It's actually me. It's personal, right? The elements of emotional relevance, the third one is be personal. They know it. They're talking to me, not generic messenger. They're talking to me. I'm already connected. As a matter of fact, they also send me a text offering me to track, right? Way channel of communication. Once they establish it, now they can throw in there some relevant information and upselling, etc. The one thing, unfortunately, for them that they missed is that this was the ad on the email that I got confirmation. And unfortunately for them, when you miss on an ad like that, for me, I'm not into uh, sports bras. Psychologically, the effect is the same for positive or negative, right? My impact negatively on their brand is the same impact as if it was positive. And of course, for me, this was negative. So mm, not so much with Adidas, just this. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the uh, favorite part of uh, my session today is when I introduce to you uh, my guest today. And my guest today is uh, none other than Jordan Mendoza. And uh, I took a snippet of his uh, LinkedIn profile. And for those of uh, you who don't know Jordan Mendoza, do you mind uh, maybe giving just a couple of sentences, Jordan, about yourself, kind of high level, who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, first off, you know, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for having me on. You know, I'm definitely learning uh, a couple new things about emotional relevance. So that's, that's always a bonus, right? Um, so my name is Jordan Mendoza. I, um, I work full time for a company called Gables Residential. It's a national property management company. And I've had the pleasure of working there for 13 years. Um, I, uh, you know, started on site doing leasing and worked my way up and I've been in a, a training and development role for the past eight years. And, you know, part of my responsibility is uh, creating content. You know, I, I teach a six month leadership program each year that rotates from Atlanta to, to DC. Uh, and then I also have a, a consulting business where I help uh, people and, and brands grow through content strategy. Uh, and I host a, a podcast. So uh, I do all of that uh, as a father of four, and one on the way. So um, uh, I'm a little busy, uh, but I always love to make time, especially for uh, any any chance I get to talk about what I do and add value to other people. So I appreciate Jordan, you having me on. Jordan, I, I, I'm so glad you're here because I know once you uh, have your fifth kid that you're going to be going underwater for like 17 years. So <laughs> before we go into emotional anchoring in your world, when you and I talked and opened up and, and we got personal, um, you shared with me some stories from your life. And, and one story that really changed your life and made an impact on you was when you were 12, um, you were at a 7-Eleven waiting for the bus to show up playing an arcade game. Could, do you mind sharing with the group what happened there? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'd be happy to share. So just to give you guys some, some context. So I grew up in Portland, Oregon, um, um, you know, Pacific Northwest, a lot of rain, you know, um, but when, when you grow up there, you don't, you don't realize it's rainy until you leave, right? You think that that's kind of normal all over the country. Um, so I grew up in Portland and uh, between the summer of sixth and seventh grade, we had moved from one you know, really not so great area to another area. And, um, you know, I had, gone to school with the people um, that at my middle school since kindergarten. So I didn't want to, you know, make this move over the summer and then have to, you know, go to a new school and, and make new friends. So I begged my mom, I said, listen, I, I don't care if I have to, t how many buses I have to take, I want to be able to go and finish up at least seventh grade at, at um, uh, this middle school. And so she agreed on it. And we um, set up the bus route. I had to take one public bus. 
um, to right in front of a 7-Eleven. And then I would have about a 30 minute wait and I would take, uh, grab the next bus and that would drop me off right in front of the street that my middle school was on. And so I, I made this trip several times. I was on one of my standard trips. I had a very, very set routine. It was, I would walk in, I would say hi to the lady Rosa that worked there. And then I would go straight to the Mortal Kombat 2 game, which is a game that I invested a lot of my quarters in back then. And I would play the game until Rosa would let me know the bus was out front. And then I would go jump on the bus and make my way to school. And so it was a regular day, just like all the other days. I had done this routine several times. I'm sitting there, I'm playing Mortal Kombat. And I can hear the door chimes of the 7-Eleven go off, as, as you do when you're in the store. Um, but I was used to that, so I didn't really turn around or anything. Um, and then I actually heard a, a man's voice uh, say, hey, Daniel. And, you know, my name's Jordan, so I didn't respond to that. Um, and he only had said it once. And then before I knew it, um, my body had actually been lifted, right? Shoved into the pinball game next to me, which was a Terminator 2 pinball game. It had a metal gun, which is where you pull the trigger to launch the ball. So my ribs got shoved into that. I actually started getting... put me in a cop car and you know I was begging them I was actually saying listen I am not Daniel my name is Jordan they know they said we know you are a Hispanic runaway we know it's you we, we we've got you you're being taken down to the station and I said listen look in my jacket look in my jacket pocket I have my homework in there and sure enough the officer literally looks in the pocket he reaches out he opens up my homework and when he does he has that like look of like he saw a ghost on his face, like, mm -hmm. wow, I, I screwed up here. And he calls my mom. He, he, you know, I'm of course crying my eyes out. I'm, I'm hurt. I'm confused. And he calls and said, there was a misunderstanding. Where can we drop your son off at? And she, she was on the other side of town. So she said, well, he's closer to his best friend's house. Let's go ahead and drop him off. Uh, we'll drop him off there. And so I, you know, went to school like it was a normal day. I got dropped off at my friend's house. Him and I walked to school. And then you know, I was so distraught at that time that I, they brought me to the, the office because they, they saw I was upset. They didn't know what was happening. And that's when my mom, you know, came to pick me up. And, you know, the officers, they ended up getting fired. They both lose their jobs. And, um, you know, this was a clear case of, you know, racially profiling somebody, right? The, uh, the kicker here is, you know, although my na last name is Mendoza, I'm not actually Spanish. My dad's from the Philippines and my mom is uh, Irish and, and Native American. So, you know, they, they thought I was somebody I wasn't and, you know, they, they did lose their jobs because of it. But, you know, for, and for me, uh, I didn't want to go through this whole process of like, let's, let's go to court and I wanted it to be over. I wanted, I knew that not all police officers were bad because I'd have experienced the good ones, but I knew that these people were. And, and for me, it was about making sure that they, they got what they deserve, which is they shouldn't, they shouldn't wear that badge, right? They, they shouldn't be able to go out and say they're, um, they're serving and protecting when they're not. So, um, but that's, uh, that's some more context for you. Well, amazing story, obviously, and oh so timely. <laughs> but um, just to take a step back for a second on, on what we're all feeling right now. First of all, for me, it's amazing how, again, when we go through an emotional experience, uh, Jordan had gone through a terrible emotional experience, but the way he described it, he remembers, you know, probably the, the color of the gun on the machine that he was thrown at because it was so emotional for him, right? But also another aspect of emotional relevance is now that he has shared the story and we all have gone through an emotional experience with him together, I can only imagine that whether you like it or not, now you feel much more closer to Jordan without even knowing him, right? And a little bit more trust without even knowing him because he was vulnerable enough and open enough to share and took us through an emotional experience versus just saying, hey, I'm doing sales for the company and, you know, yada, yada. Which, again, the point is uh, be personal, 
which will help the, uh, the relationship. So Jordan, thank you very much for sharing. Um, going to a topic today of emotional anchoring. So you're selling basically to tenants, you're selling to people to buy uh, apartments or to lease apartments, et cetera. What, how would you use today in your world emotional anchoring after you sold a, uh, an apartment? Do you have any method or any uh, way that you do it today? Yeah, yeah. The, the you know one of the things that that I teach and a lot of the sales content that I build, um, you know, f- for one, it's important that after there's a transaction, right? Because you know, sales to me, it, it's a transaction, but it's built off of a relationship, right? And if you want that relationship to be sustainable, there are certain things that you have to do once that transaction's final, or else people look at it just as a transaction. And so what what I've taught our teams to do is whenever that sale is completed, it is to immediately follow up, right? Follow up with that prospect and make sure that they have pertinent information like, you know, what what their new address is and all the things they're going to need on that move in day, but also adding a key element, something personal that you learned during the time that they spent with you because you know in our industry the the sales cycle can be as soon as you need a place you come in for a tour you like it and you lease so it could be a very short cycle and there are some of course where they need to talk to somebody else they've got a roommate or they've got a spouse so uh, i always teach them to make sure you bring something up personal that you've learned about them after that sale and that transaction takes place in the form of you following up, right? So for example, if I learned during the sales cycle that they had a pet and that pet maybe was injured, you know, I would make sure that when I followed up and saying, hey, we we can't wait to welcome you and your dog Fluffy to the community. I hope he feels better because he's going to really enjoy the dog park when he, when he's healed up. Right, so that's one of the ways that I teach people to. So just like Adidas did, when you give them the welcome gift or whatever after they sold, you want to make sure that they know how to reach back to you, right? Which is establishing the two-way channel communication. A little tip for all of you who are selling out there: um, it, I would take it a step further, not just here is to call me, but here's the number to call me but I'm going to reach out to you in two weeks, in three weeks, whatever date, right? Because then it lifts off that burden of them, you know, calling you or when you call them later and they didn't call you. So I'm, I'll call you in three weeks on that date and hopefully we can catch up and talk, right? It's a great little trick that I learned over the years. So you establish the two-way channel of communication and make it personal by knowing something about them. You're giving them pertinent information like their address <laughs> and those of us who have moved know how uh, how important it is when we realize a day after we moved in that we don't know what our address is yeah and and so there's a few other things right like how to reserve the elevator right so we actually book move in appointments because let's face it folks if if for everyone that's on here, moving sucks. Like it is one of the most painful and terrible things that we have to do as, as humans. Like some people would, you know, rather, rather do a lot of things than move. It's not the most, you know, the best experience you're going to have in your life. And so we want to make sure, especially in my industry, that when people show up, that their keys are ready, that they've got a move in gift that thanks them for investing this $50,000 a year that they're going to be giving us. Because, you know, as you know, writing that check, if you're, if you're a renter, that's the largest check you're going to write every single month. So, uh-huh. yeah, we want to make sure we take care of them. We want to make sure that they have a time to meet with us and to go over the details and to inspect this apartment before they actually move in. We want to be there in part of that journey. Because uh-huh. for, for, for one, it's going to give us the benefit knowing that everything's in order. But for two, it shows them how much we care and that it wasn't just a transaction that we're actually, we're going to be here for this 12 months that you've just committed. That's, for me, it's fascinating because again, the, those techniques, you know, apply for every, every type of business. Anybody has any question for, um, for Jordan? Anybody, please. I got a note. Should be a fine balance between using what you have learned intrusive or over personal 
keeping that balance is key to establishment of the relationship. Look, uh, Aaron wrote that. I agree conceptually. Yes, I agree. You got to know the audience. You got to know the lay of the land. You got to know the policy of the company that you work for, uh, et cetera. Absolutely. But I don't think it takes away from all these elements of, you know, what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, you got to know. And it sounds like uh, you write it from experience. I can tell you the last company I worked for, you know, HR had me on speed dial. Uh, um, and so, yeah, I'm a little bit more passionate than what most corporates are. But um, I don't disagree. All right, any questions for Jordan? Uh, while you're thinking about questions or comments for Jordan, as you can see on the, on the screen, uh, Jordan has a successful uh, podcast, Blaze Your Own Trail, and uh, I'm actually gonna be on it sometimes in the next month or so. I'll let everybody know online, and it was uh, really a personal, experience for me to be on there sharing some of my stories that I never shared uh, out there and so it got a little emotional uh, and um, so if you want to listen to it it's really great uh, podcast to, to listen to some interesting people sharing the story so Jordan, I couldn't thank you enough uh, for being here and uh, just to summarize and uh, recap if anybody has any comments or questions please go ahead but uh, now you know what is emotional anchoring and ways of using emotional anchoring. Remember, after the sale, it's super, super crucial. Establish the two-way of channel communication. Pour, pour some emotional relevant data or information in there. Uh, make it personal. Stand out and make an impact. Those are the three elements of emotional relevance. And you definitely know now who is uh, Jordan Mendoza. Uh, on my blog, I wrote a piece about emotional anchoring a few months back. Uh, feel free to go on my website again, lovezybert.com, and, um, and go to my blog. Might as well, since you are all here, I'll share it with you um, so you can see my beautiful website and uh, the blog. So sign up. It comes out every two weeks into your uh, email. Uh, this is the blog and every two weeks I post something as you can see it's a three minute read usually maybe four um, and it's uh, I get a lot of uh, reactions from it all I want when you read it is basically to go huh yeah right and hopefully you can get something for it from it for your life ladies and gentlemen it's uh, 45 minutes uh, right now as promised, and I want to make sure that I uh, cherish your time, and I thank you very much for spending it with me today. Uh, as always, I'm going to stick around for a few minutes if anybody has any questions or follow up with an email, and uh, thank you, and have an amazing rest of the day wherever you are. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Salon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Galit. Thank you, Lenore. Thank you, Skip. Thank you, Alan. Hey, Adam. Thank you very much. You doing okay, man? Yeah, I'm doing good. Things are coming well. I got your email yesterday. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let, I'll keep you updated. I put in the application, so you can send a message to Inga saying thank you for me. I sure will, man. Sure will. All right, we'll be in touch. Yes, sir. All right, Yvonne, I saw you came in late, but I see a note here, so thank you for coming. Cheers, Alon. Got to run. Hey, Andrew, thank you for coming, man. Say hi to yeah. everybody. You bet. See ya. All right. Yariv. Thank you, sir. Hi, I got your note. I appreciate it. I think uh, you should. I should do it. I like it. All right, Aaron, see you later. Yeah. Thank you. I'll talk, I'll talk to you in the next week or so. All right, man. Good to Good. see you. And thank you for the, you know, the, the hour of conversation that I so. <laughs> was it good? Yeah, it was pretty good. Pretty good. I liked it. I liked it. I figured I might as well just uh, join in, see what you're all about and all that kind of fun stuff. All right. Awesome, man. I'm glad you did. Yeah, yeah, for sure. How's things with you? What's going on? Slowly but surely, man. 
Okay. Having a blast. Yeah, well, I, you know that I'm like an hour and a half away from the entire NBA season. Yeah. I'm in Gainesville, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. Got, got one of these all the time. But for me, it's – oh, wait, you can't see it with this background thing. Yeah, the mask. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been living with those, so for me, it's no, no different whatsoever. All right, buddy. Well, talk to me next week, then. You got it. Hey, by the way, if you ever need me to tell my story, be glad to. You Might know be what? You can Maybe use. I Maybe yeah. I we'll figure out how to tie it in. Uh, I, I actually have a guy who's looking for, he's got a podcast, a really cool podcast. Uh, a guy, Jesse, that was here earlier. And he yeah. asked me yesterday if I know anybody interesting. I'll, I'm, I'll introduce to, to him. I don't know about interesting, but at least I have a good story. Oh, man. Maybe a late night podcast that you're trying to fall asleep to or something. There you go. Hi, <laughs> oh, buddy. All right, man. Talk to you Take soon. Care. Take right. care.